Welcome back to Bobby's Brain Dump. Today's topic is about Putin's lies. And I was really thinking about this in a really serious way, but I've just this morning come around to the idea that there's not really a serious way to handle this. Before we tear into it, we've kind of got to acknowledge the fact that all politicians lie. Perhaps you haven't been telling the truth, Pinocchio. Oh, but I have! Every single word! And especially the more powerful a country is, the more likely the leaders of that country are going to be lying. That's just... That may as well be in a textbook. The difference is that Putin lies, but he's super incompetent. None of it makes sense. He doesn't do any background work, he just spews things out. And the whole so I hope you bought your swimmers, because we're going on a journey. We're going on a journey into Putin's vomit. The first one we're going to look at is Eastern Promises. This particular lie is the one that Putin tells about NATO, saying that NATO promised the Soviet Union that there would be no eastward expansion. When I talk to most people about the Cold War, most people say, what was the Cold War? Or maybe they remember um, the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, something like that. But I find it funny how people that back Russia are now all experts on the Cold War and the happenings of the Cold War. I'm going to outline a general idea of what the claim is because there's all sorts of different flavors of claim. But the general idea is that NATO signed an agreement with the Soviet Union that they would not expand eastward. Now, there's a lot of angles we could go through here, and there is a kernel of truth to this. When this agreement was signed, this was the state of Europe. You basically have NATO touching the Soviet Union, and to the south you have two neutral countries, Austria and Yugoslavia. Before we go anywhere else, let's think about this. Where was NATO going to expand to? Was it going to be Austria, which the perpetually neutral country, or Yugoslavia, the communist perpetually neutral country? Where on the map was NATO going to expand to? A lot of American leadership saw the collapse of the Soviet Union as undesirable. It would have been really tumultuous, there would have been lots of chaos, they'd be worried about civil wars breaking out, and so a broken but intact Soviet Union would be preferable to, you know, a dozen civil wars happening all at the same time. George Bush the first, he even goes over to uh, Ukraine and he begs Ukraine to stay in the Soviet Union, to which they say no. So where is this promise of no eastward expansion? Well, it comes from the agreement of East Germany reunifying with Western Germany. And the promise is specifically about no expansion of NATO into East Germany. German forces would be allowed to obviously go into East Germany, but not international NATO forces. And when the initial conversations were happening, the language that was used was very vague. Several leaders promised Gorbachev that there would be no expansion to the east. And then one of the American officials is told to pull his head in, because this could be taken the wrong way, as to mean that there would be no eastward expansion at all of NATO. And anyway, we can look at the treaty that was signed. And the treaty that was signed deals specifically with Eastern Germany. So the treaty states that, Following the completion of the withdrawal of the Soviet armed forces from the territory of the present German Democratic Republic and of Berlin, units of German armed forces assigned to military alliance structures in the same way as those in the rest of German territory may also be stationed in that part of Germany. But without nuclear weapon carriers, this does not apply to conventional weapon systems, which may have other capabilities in addition to conventional ones, but which in that part of Germany are equipped for a conventional role and designated only for such. Foreign armed forces and nuclear weapons or their carriers will not be stationed in that part of Germany or deployed there. So it seems like a bit of a stretch to go from you're not allowed to deploy NATO forces in Eastern Germany to NATO promised not to advance eastward. There are no other treaties signed between NATO and the Soviet Union or the Warsaw Pact that discusses any other advances east. I don't understand why people don't read treaties. A lot of the times they are very short and very easy to read. The people that are using this 
Easton Promise's idea are either not doing their research or they're choosing to ignore the parts that undermine what they're saying. Now, some people might say that regardless of the specific words that are written in the treaty, there is something referred to as the spirit of the treaty, right? And this, you know, like what the treaty kind of means, not necessarily the specific words that it says. And Gorbachev and others have said that the NATO advanced eastward goes against the spirit of the treaty. Two things. The Soviet Union doesn't exist any longer. The Russian Federation is not the Soviet Union. And Russia has been stomping all over its treaties that the Soviet Union signed, like the one where Ukraine was given Crimea. So why should anybody have any respect towards Russia grabbing at Soviet Union treaties? Shut the f The next is, it wasn't written down, go chew on some rocks. Tough shit. If you are a global power and you want something to be on a treaty, then you should have it written on the treaty. It's not like they ran out of paper or ran out of ink. If the Soviet Union had a concern with NATO coming eastward, then it would have been reflected in the treaty. And it was not. Editing Bobby here. While I was researching this, I also found this comment from Mary Sarot saying that Russian claims of betrayal are technically untrue, but have psychological truth. Get fucked. So now we're looking at historical revisionism to support a modern point and a modern concern. The next thing is this idea of NATO advancing. By saying that, it makes it sound like NATO is on this military campaign to push right up on Russia's borders. But these countries have all chosen to join NATO out of fear of Russia. So NATO isn't so much advancing as former Soviet states are pulling NATO towards them. If Russia was a good neighbor, it wouldn't have these concerns with NATO. Which is, I kind of find this funny when people say, oh, well, the US would never allow uh, nuclear missiles in Cuba. Why does Russia have to have nuclear missiles on its borders? No one ever complains that Ireland has nuclear missiles on their borders, right? The only reason why you'd complain is if you're doing something that would be antagonistic towards that alliance. This whole idea of nuclear weapons on Russia's border is insane. NATO reduces nuclear proliferation. Now, I know that sounds insane, Right? Because every country is babysitting nuclear bombs for the USA. But now Ukraine is considering rearming its nuclear stockpile. So instead of having US nuclear bombs on the border, you'll have, you know, a solid 500 Ukrainian nuclear weapons on your border. So I know that took a while, but it's probably the only claim that has any sort of merit. The other ones are going to be relatively quick. The next claim is that Russia isn't invading to occupy or take over Ukraine. Putin has claimed that he's just basically there to decapitate the leadership. He just wants to get rid of Zelensky and the progressive government that was installed after the 2014 Euromaidan revolution. We know that this isn't true. Putin was aiming for a fate accompli. He wanted to basically have Ukraine invaded and taken before the rest of the world could react to it. And in this he failed. And we know what his plans were for Ukraine because the weekend after the invasion, there was a very similar article posted on a bunch of Russian websites that all carried a similar theme about what was going to happen to Ukraine. And there's quite a chilling bit where it's mentioned that Either as a separate country or as part of Russia, Ukraine's future will continue. Which kind of implies that Russia wanted to take Ukraine or at least dominate it. I think Putin views Ukraine sort of like how China views Taiwan. The rest of the world recognizes it as a separate sovereign state. But China sees Taiwan as a rogue state that's broken away and needs to be brought back into the fold. And you could say the same about Putin with Ukraine. He sees it as part of the greater Russian nation. Now at this point, before we go on to the other things I want to talk about with Putin and his lies, I just want to talk about us for a minute. I just want to talk about me and you and you and me, you know, the relationship we're building. And I want to be inside your suggested videos list. So if you could do me a huge favor and hit subscribe, hit like, that would do heaps for me. Thank you. 
the Ukrainian government is led by Nazis and drug users. Now this one, the reason why I kind of clump these two together is this is a massive dog whistle to the Russian population. It doesn't really ring out to the rest of the world as it would with Slavic nations that bore the brunt of Nazi racial aggression. In the rest of the world, calling somebody a Nazi has just become relatively common. But in Eastern Europe, it still carries quite a lot of weight. And so calling the Ukrainian government Nazis is saying that they're like the worst possible of all possible enemies. Same with drug users, right? Drug users in Russia are considered subhuman. They're not real people anymore. And there's actually a really interesting Vice documentary on it that you should definitely watch. But basically it's saying that these really evil people that aren't really even people are leading this country, this brother country of ours, away and we need to step in and sort this out. Obviously none of this is true. Zelensky's Jewish, right? Which kind of clashes with the whole idea of being a Nazi. And as much as there's a lot made of the Azov Battalion, Ukraine is one of the more tolerant countries in Eastern Europe. The last claim I want to talk about is the idea that Russia stepped in to stop a genocide in eastern Ukraine. And this claim is wildly untrue. The amount of violent deaths in eastern Ukraine have dropped severely since 2014. And remember, there are a lot of international parties monitoring the situation. It's not like we just have to rely on Ukraine or Russia's word on what was happening. And so if there was a genocide, we would be expecting to see the numbers spike. But as I said, they're dropping and then staying steady. And so it'd be very, very difficult to hide a genocide. Now, the reason I made this video is that I know all of these things are really obvious, but not everybody kind of digs into the same sort of articles as the, as the people that have like a, a very keen interest on this. And so I kind of just wanted to point out some of the main ones. If you see anybody repeating these points, then don't even engage with it because the same people that are apologists for the Russian activities now would have been apologists for Hitler's actions back in the 1930s. And so just remember that these people are either being incredibly disingenuous or they are so terribly brainwashed that you're not going to be able to convince them otherwise. Most of the people that were defending Putin's actions early on, and even some of the ones now, are just primarily anti-American. And don't get me wrong, I think there are a lot of things to critique America on, but they are so viciously anti-American that they will support anything that is in opposition to America. And I think this provides a really important lesson as to why we shouldn't let the actions of our enemy's enemy decide how we should treat them. Because otherwise you can end up supporting some really horrible stuff. For example, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Oh, snap. Anyway, guys, I hope you have learned something today and maybe had a bit of a laugh or enjoyed yourself. Um, I'm not really sure how to, to introduce the videos. You know, everyone's got like the, the classic one is, you know, like the, what's up, guys? And so, I don't know, I'll figure something out. But if you have any suggestions, pop them down below. Um, I have a Patreon link below. If you have a couple of bucks to spare, it'd be really nice to get some support so I can sort of add to things. But yeah, let me know what you thought. Hit the like, hit the subscribe, all that jazz, and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.